We open on this guy listening to what sounds like newcomer country music. Apparently he's come to this hotel to meet the woman in the picture he's looking at, but she hasn't shown herself yet. Have some more tea. I'll be out in a Something seems to happen when he drinks the tea. When I saw your picture, I had to meet you. She appears, but we only see her from the back. I love you, Clara. Seems like they really hit it off. <laughs> but he gets stabbed by a two-bladed knife. The next morning, a couple guys are painting the inside of the Francisco house. Sorry, Mr. Francisco, you see, I'm trying to finish art school. I've had to prepare an exhibit for my master's degree. Someone stole two paintings out of my truck, and I, on top of that, I've had finals. Also, Susan is preggers. I could have told him that. <laughs> you were sent. And the painters are noticing. Did you know Leonard's an artist? He's very good. I'd love to paint you, Mrs. Francisco. Oh, well, thank you, Leonard. Why don't you paint the house first, Leonard? George, you've got to go to work. You're late. Don't worry, Mr. Francisco. We'll take good care of your wife. Yeah, I bet you will. Later at work, Matt tells George he's just jealous. It's biology. The Tanktonese female in her first quarter of pregnancy gives off a scent that makes her extremely desirable to the Tanktonese male. He also tries to get George to watch the Three Stooges with him. Yeah, Larry, Moe, and Curly. I don't think he's seen it, Matt. Then they go to the morgue to check out the body of the victim from the opening. Ralph Emerson. Ralph Emerson was an essayist from the 1800s. Simultaneous puncture wounds to both hearts. Death was instantaneous. That's the same memo as the guy last week. Huh? What was his name? Alex Bell. Yeah. Probably referencing Alexander Graham Bell. Pickle in that love potion. <laughs> Sardanac is no joke. It creates a tremendous attraction. When a Tanktonese has sex under its influence, he or she is bonded physically and emotionally. Yeah, I got it. Yes, you may remember that Sardanac played a part in 15 with Wanda, where they had to keep the couple who took it separated. I said it would make another appearance, and here it is. Hey, did you and Susan do that? Well, that is none of your business. No, we didn't. Anyway, they found some evidence on the body, namely a pen with the name of a computer dating service on it. So they go there and talk to the guy who runs it in. Traditionally, Tanktonese do not search for mates. We feel a sense of roll car, what you would call predestination. But that leaves so much to chance. Holy shit, that's Ted Raimi. Uh, pff, anyway, the character's name is Johnny Appleseed. Uh, look, say I wanted a date. How do I see what I'm getting? Do you? What? Want a date? Nah, he's already got Kathy. We fax our clients their date's picture so they know exactly what they're getting. I noticed you're wearing a wedding ring. Happy. Very. Thank you. Anyway, it turns out that Ralph Emerson went out with someone named Clara yeah, Bow. That's the name of an actress from the silent film era. Anyway, she's dated three men in the last two weeks. So they print out the info and her picture, and George is quite distracted by it. Alex Spell. Get the DB. Are they stiff? What's the matter with you? So they go to Clara Bow's apartment, and her cleaning lady is there, who has scarring on one half of her face. We'd like to ask uh, Ms. Bow a couple of questions. When will she be back? I don't know. About six months. Before that, I was in the rehabilitation center. She explains that she was near the engine room when the spaceship crashed. And again, George won't stop looking at that picture of Clara Bow. Afterwards, Matt asks what's up with him. A face that launched a thousand ships. Helen of Troy. For Tinktonese, Clara Bow has that face. Whatever you say. There's one other guy she dated. Let's check him out. Guy named Ted Healy. Ted Healy is the name of the vaudeville performer who basically created the Three Stooges. This is another episode that is just stuffed with reference names. This guy has cool markings, they almost look like lightning bolts. Anyway, he hasn't seen Clara and is worried about her. Murder? You don't think it was Clara? No, I'm sure she's a regular girl scout. Hey, you watch your mouth! He also doesn't like Matt talking bad about her. Did you sort an act with her? No. If you want police protection, I can arrange it. No, I'm not afraid. I just want to see her again. I just want to see her again. Aww. Later, Matt is showing Kathy the Three Stooges, and she clearly isn't as into it as he is. He scraped a saw across his forehead. Oh, I love it. You'd think that slapstick would be universal, but maybe not when it's as violent as the Three Stooges is when you really think about it. Why is the dark-haired one so mean to his friends? 
He's hitting them and poking them in the eyes. Kathy just sees people hurting each other being played for laughs, and it just seems sadistic to her. And the language. Do you know what nyuk 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 means in Tanktonese? No, but I would love to. Did he just climb over the coffee table? I'm, I'm trying to share something special with you. If you can't uh, appreciate it, uh, just forget it. Doesn't like the Three Stooges, zero out of 10. What's your idea funny? She prefers Herbie the love bug. Remember at the end, when the car separated in two? That's not funny, that's, that's stupid. That's for kids. Rude. And this is for adults? Look, I should have known, you're from outer space. How can I expect you to have a sense of humor? Rude. I just don't have your sense of humor. I think I'll go home and read a book. I guess it was just a matter of time until they had their first fight. The next day, Matt and George go to check out another body, and this one was found washed up next to the Santa Monica Pier. Looks a lot more gooey than the one in the movie. And it was the guy they were talking to earlier. Also, the clothes indicate double puncture wounds. Remember that newcomers have two hearts. That's why the weapon was made that way. It's pretty much the only way to kill one instantly. They don't know yet if he took Sardanac. Come on, George, I want to get my appetite back before lunch. Of course, all these victims are all connected to Clara Bow, so Matt is convinced that she's a black widow, but George doesn't think so. Uh, it's not your brain you're thinking with here. It's a whole other organ. You got the hots for it. I will not even dignify that with a reply. Then George makes sure Matt isn't looking before pulling out the picture of Clara Bow again. Later, when George goes home, he brings flowers for Susan, likely out of guilt. But she's not there. Where is everyone? M's, Jill's, and I don't know where mom is. And the painter isn't there either. Well, maybe she had a doctor appointment. She had that yesterday. You need a new harness for the pod. No, she already ordered that. You're a big help, Buck. Anyway, Susan comes home and says that she just felt like taking a drive in Palm Springs that day. It was a beautiful day. The sun was shining. I felt wonderful. Blame it on the pregnancy. I just felt like getting some natural UV. When she's in the other room, he snoops through her purse. Shame on you, George. All right. Also projecting a little, aren't you? You're the one who's been gazing at another woman's picture all day. Oh, you found it. Turns out to be a gift she bought him. Your purse fell over. These things uh, jumped out. Uh, I was just putting them back in. The stone is real agate. Do you like it? Oh, yes, it's it's very nice. Take that, George. Meanwhile, Matt goes to Kathy's with a tape of W.C. Fields. Hey, Kathy. Just a minute, Daniel. But she has company. Are you all right? Yeah, fine. Wait, Matt, I'm confused. Often, you act like you don't really like me. And now, you seem angry because I'm with someone else. Yeah, that's Matt in a nutshell. Maybe you're looking for a different type of relationship. Something more intimate? No! Why do you ask me things like that? People don't talk about relationships, they just have them. Oh? But if I was gonna have a relationship, you know what I'd want? I'd want someone you could count on. Uh, someone who's there. Someone you could, who's not off doing other things. Yeah, good thing he's not mad or anything. I'm talking hypothetically, of course. You understand? No. I didn't think so. At the station the next morning, George confesses what he did. Oh my God! I thought she was with another man. You're a real ping pong, George. One minute, you're hot after another woman. Next minute, you're worried your wife's sleeping around. Matt does make a good point there. George is being pretty weird. I know women. They'll lie. They'll cheat on you. I told you before you're jealous. And you probably got good reason. You should have given Susan a dose of Sardinac. After we finish with Matt's racism, we'll have to work on his misogyny. But anyway, George claims he's not jealous. Once again, it dates back to the ship. We didn't choose our own mates. The overseers did. Susan and I were no exception. But we were lucky. We fell in love after we were paired. But I've often wondered, if Susan had had the choice to begin with, would she have picked me? I'm afraid, Matt. I'm not jealous. I mean, you can be both. Then George gets an alert that Clara Bow made a date with a guy named Marvin Gardens. Speaking of which, cut to the guy waiting for Clara to show herself like the guy in the beginning. I guess she just really likes that song. 
So he's clearly on Sardanac when Matt and George break down the door. So guess who the first person he sees is? Stand there. Put your hands on top of your head. He's like, yes, daddy. I'm Marv. Shut up. We lost her, Matt. Matt. What a beautiful man. Don't move. Later they question him, but it's hard because he's kind of distracted. The woman in the hotel room, remember? You have such a forceful voice, Matt. What's going on? He's ingested Sardanac. He is bonded to Matt. Why would you tell Dobbs about that? We, uh, we didn't speak much. She was in the bedroom the whole night. You know, Matt, I like women, but I find you very compelling. Cut that out. I'm going to break your jaw. I, I mean it. I mean it. I sense a little hint of homophobia in Matt here. What a shock. Am I going to be here in wedding bells soon? Is he making fun of you? Oh, no. I just respect true love. Hey, hey, hey. You're a very forgiving person, Matt. Sit down! You can tell something's wrong with him because he thinks way too highly of Matt. I mean, I love him, but perfect godlike figure he is not. I think I'll leave these two birds. Alone. Yeah, stop being a troublemaker, Dobbs, jeez. So they finally get to the important stuff, and Matt asks why he drank the Sardanac when meeting a woman for the first time. I, uh, don't remember anything about Sardanac, Matt. I mean, Sergeant. She must have put it in his tea without him knowing. So there is nothing you can tell us about Clara Bow. She's a face in a picture, that's all. I'm interested in someone much more real. Enough! I've heard enough! Mr. Gardens, you can go. I'd like to stay. Go out now! Jesus, Matt's less freaked out when a bomb goes off. He cares very much for you. George has a thought and starts entering something into the computer. Turns out he's arranging a date with Clara Bow. Yes, I did look up George Drum and all I got was various drummers named George. So at least that one isn't a reference. Another good idea, George. But just remember, she's a suspect and you're a cop. Later, Matt goes home to find someone waiting for him. Who let you in? I helped a woman with her groceries. <sighs> well, you're out of here right now. Matt, please. Don't call me that. And he asks Kathy for help. This guy drank some Sardanac and I can't get rid of him. Well, he's bonded to you then. I know that. How do I get rid of him? Well, you should have thought of that before you gave him the Sardanac. Don't yell at him. <laughs> Not the first time he did that and she thought it was weird. It happened at work. I busted into a hotel room. He'd just taken a dose of this stuff and looked at me and whammo. She gets it now. You were the first person he saw? <laughs> and finds it hilarious. What's so funny? He's perfect for you. He's exactly what you wanted. He's available. He'll laugh when you want him to. He's someone you can control. This whole conversation is gold. You haven't had sex with him yet, have you? Not yet. Shut up! Well, if the person doesn't have sex with the individual he or she is bonded to, the effects of Sardanac wear off in about a month. Oof, that's a long time. I'd try to avoid too much intimate contact if I were you. <laughs> Night, Matt. Uh, Kathy. <laughs> I'd say Kathy was being mean, but Matt had it coming after the Three Stooges incident. So Marvin tries to make excuses to get into Matt's apartment, and Matt actually tries to let him down easily. Look, uh, you like me, right? You want to make me happy? More than anything. I'd be really happy if you went home now. You're sure? I'd be ecstatic. Well then, I... I guess it's good night. <sighs> See ya. Meanwhile, rare, there's some humming going on. And that's not Susan. No! <sighs> yeah, of course it was a nightmare. It seems like poor George just wakes up screaming every night. No wonder he's so uptight, he never gets enough sleep. Of course, he doesn't tell Susan what it was about, again. But he does bring up something with her. It would be a good idea if we start an act. Why? I love you, and I want to reaffirm that. Reaffirm us. It turns out they did have this discussion once before, but they both decided against it. I just want us to be happy. <laughs> we are happy. I just noticed Susan wears a lot of mascara to bed. Do you want an out from our relationship? Is that it? No. I just want to have free will. Don't twist this. And now George is all but accusing her of wanting to cheat on him. I love you, but I won't do Sardanac. Sardanac is slavery, George. We're not slaves. We have to accept every aspect of our freedom. 
you the next here. morning. I, uh, I brought you a present. Marvin's kind of adorable. They're our guys. Yeah, they really bring out the color in your eyes. Dobbs, I'm warning you. Can I watch you work? I won't bother you. No! Anyway, Matt takes him aside and tries to reason with him. But you gotta listen to me. You and me, it can't work out. You've got a chemical inside your body. What you're feeling isn't real. I've never felt so real. <sighs> this won't work out. He's surprisingly nice about it at this point. Look, Marvin, for a tank to knees, you're not a bad looking guy. You've got a good personality, you're generous. In a couple of weeks, you'll find someone else. You'll forget all about me, okay? Of course, uh, I'm disappointed, very disappointed. Oh, poor Marvin. So there's been a search on Clara Bow, and apparently she's just been spotted, so to speak. Have I made that joke already? So Matt and George go there, and George is the first to find her. Miss Bow, stop! She runs, but he catches up to her. You're under arrest, Miss Bow. Why do you call me that? My name is Bovary. Emma Bovary. Emma Bovary was the main character in the book Madame Bovary. She was someone who craved beauty, wealth, and passion as well as high society, despite living in the country. Spoiler, what it suits her. My agent says she's never seen a model take off like I have. You remember Christy Brinkley? She says I'll be bigger than she ever was. The line, remember Christy Brinkley, was funny because she was the face of cover girl at the time and was in a million commercials. These days, I wonder how many people do remember Christy Brinkley. It turns out that Emma Bovary has been in Paris for the last month and someone else has been using her picture. Calvin practically begged me to come back to New York. It was embarrassing. She just goes on and on about how everyone loves her. In fact, she ran from George because she has to deal with crazed fans a lot. Well, thank you, Miss Bovary. I'm sorry if we've caused you any inconvenience. George is a little disillusioned with this lady he had a crush on until she started talking. We were in the hills thank, above thank, Monte Carlo. Thank you, Miss Bovary. Sure. What a bumbo. Bimbo. Anyway, George's undercover line rings, and it turns out to be Clara Bow, and they make a date for later that night. Well, I got the results back from the UCLA. So it turns out that the body that they thought was Ted Healy was someone else wearing his clothes. George points out that Ted was definitely on Sardinac. You've been wanting a motive on this, George. I think I got one. Sardinac. Can make someone jealous enough to kill. So later, George goes to the hotel. There's that song again. Anyway, Clara offers him tea from the other room like she did with the last two. He tells her he drank it, so she comes out, and it's Emma Bovary's housekeeper. You look lovely, Jenny. Eat. Look at me. She stole the picture of Emma when she worked at a modeling agency, bookkeeping. He tells her that the men she drugged have ended up dead, but she swears she didn't do it. Yes, I believe you. George asks if she remembers remember Ted, Ted Healy. Healy. Yes. We believe he faked his own death. We think the Sardanac has made him so jealous he will murder anyone he sees you with. I never meant for anything like that to happen. You don't know what it's like living with this face. But you had Ted. Why the others? He wasn't enough. She tells her story and boy is it ever sad. I used to be so beautiful. Men loved me. I could have anyone I wanted. But after the crash, when this happened to me, no man would touch me. I walk down the streets. People stare at me. Children point. God, we are quit. She just wants her old life back. But when George is walking her to her car, they get attacked by Ted. George gets stabbed in the shoulder, then Matt gets slashed in the hand. And then Ted overpowers him while George is stunned. <laughs> And it's Marvin to the rescue. He stops Ted long enough for George to shoot him. He doesn't die, but he's down. Where'd you come from? Anyway, Marvin was following Matt around because he was worried about him, which is kind of sweet if creepy. Well, hey, Marv. Thanks. At least Matt can put his icky feelings aside long enough to thank him and even be nice. Meanwhile, Jenny is telling Ted she's sorry. I love you. George is most likely thinking about the drawbacks to Sardanac. Later, George meets Susan at home, and she has a surprise for him. Sardanac. It means that much to you. Oh, Susan, I love you. 
He pops the lid off and dumps it down the drain. When we were paired, we had no choice. Because we love each other so much. We must always have a choice. Freedom is difficult, but it's better than the alternative. Commence the humming. <laughs> Meanwhile, Matt goes over to see Kathy once again with another tape. Oh, that T.C. Fields you mentioned? W.C. W.C. Fields. No, no, this is uh, Herbie the Love Bug. Well, someone I respect gave it a good review. I thought I ought to reevaluate it. Oh. What's that look? Outside, Marvin is bringing Matt flowers, and then turns and walks away. Oh, just give it a month, Marvin. You'll be okay. And so ends Chains of Love. Despite all the murder and Jenny's sad story, this episode was a lot lighter than the game, and so kind of a breath of fresh air. There are a lot of great quotes in the book about this episode. I could almost just have that be the recap, but I'd rather paraphrase and just include a couple of little quotes. According to writer Andrew Schneider, the theme is that love enslaved is not really love. Most of that centers around the Sardanac. You have men taking it and becoming Jenny's slaves, one of which becomes a jealous murderer. Of course, there's Marvin who becomes obsessed with Matt, something that Matt doesn't want and Marvin can't control. Then there's George wanting Susan to drink Sardanac, but she doesn't want to because it feels like slavery to her. In the end, she decides to do it for him, but he decides he agrees with her initial feeling about it. Even Matt and Kathy's disagreement to a degree. She even jokes that he wants her to think the way he does and wants to control her in a way. Real love is a risky business and there are no guarantees. Regarding Marvin, I really do want to hear from any LGBT people who think it was handled badly, but I personally think it was handled with a surprising amount of respect. Of course it's played for laughs, but I feel like the laughs are mainly aimed at Matt. Like, it's not the best look to have your main character suffer from gay panic, but Matt is the quintessential flawed character who has a lot of issues. Racism is the one hit on the most. And like his racism, he works through it and tries to be as nice as he can be to Marvin in the end. In other words, I think the show knows that Matt is in the wrong with his gay panic and we're supposed to laugh at him, not so much sympathize or relate. But again, if you think I'm wrong, let me know. As for Marvin, I think part of what makes him work so well is that the actor just plays it completely straight, so to speak. Like, he just delivers these lines in a completely serious way that doesn't make him a laughing stock. And it's really hard not to feel sorry for him in the end. A month out, I really hope Marvin is out there living his best life. Speaking of which, the actor who played him, S.A. Griffin, was in a Monsters episode I covered recently. He played the head demon in Refugee, practically the only thing that made that episode watchable. I liked him in both, to be honest. Well, that's about all I have to say about this one. It was a good episode that was mostly pretty fun, but with just enough weight to make it interesting. And if nothing else, we got Ted Raimi and Muffet head makeup. <laughs> Next up is The Red Room. See you then. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Here's some other videos you might be interested in. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you want to further support my channel, there's also Patreon. Dating is such a bizarre concept. You and your ex-wife, didn't you feel predestined? No, George, cursed. Cursed, that's very funny. <laughs>